<laughs> Where is my National Book Award? Anyway. <laughs> Questions? How do oh, we do this? We have got yeah, are we? a couple choke DVDs for a couple people who have questions. All right. So how are they going to do this? We had a bar friend. Right here, right here. So Mark has got a bar friend. Right here, right here. There you are. Okay. I guess it's just, this might go through a publisher. Go ahead. Or, but he touched on it. The kids don't come in out with the iPods, uh, all that jazz. He's going the record industry. Are you really concerned in the uh, publishing industry with Kindle and the electric? Let's face it, we're toast. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> well, I had. Uh, you know, there's a, a couple things kind of happening in that way. I had dinner with name dropping Tourette's. I had dinner with Neil Gaiman in Italy last year. I love saying that. I had dinner with Neil Gaiman in Italy last year. Oh, it was funny. Neil was saying the funniest thing in Italy. <laughs> Did I mention that I had dinner with Neil Gaiman in Italy last year? And he said that, yeah, he thinks in the same way that there'll always be pirated copies of books overseas, you know, that there will be pirated audio files. But the nature of consumption for books is so specific to books that people really like having that kind of trap door that they open up and that they are the only person consuming this thing and that this thing holds their full attention in this very stark way. And that might work with a Kindle, but you can't really have a Kindle signed. And you can't put, the, well, you can't put that, the, all those Kindles on the shelf as this kind of external cue to your date. <laughs> you know, wow, you're into the Marquis de Sade too. And you can't sort of stand there with the Kindle in public as that badging device that allows other people to come up to you and say, and that's why we got the trophy, because the trophy is that big fetish object. And when you walk down the street with that huge trophy, total strangers will cross the street to come up and go, all right. <laughs> the trophy cost me $80, I had it made. It's four feet, five inches tall. But you won't know that when you see a picture of somebody with this trophy in the future. You'll go, what'd you win that trophy for? What's the story? And so in a way, the book as an object is that badging device and is that incredibly intimate thing and is that kind of external representation of taste and consciousness. Nuss. <laughs> so there's a lot of things that books still do. So I don't think it's entirely lost. And Neil Gaiman said, yeah, there might be some pirates of things out there, but more often than not, that'll be that first little taste of smack. And they'll get that one for free. And then they'll be buying the rest for the rest of their lives. So, yeah. Well, I feel better now. Speaking of Neil Gaiman. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, speaking of Neil Gaiman, uh, I was at the 20th anniversary of Simon this past fall, and uh, Chip Kidd, who was hosting it, mentioned that Clive Barker, during a signing, somebody gave him something wrapped in a towel and said, open it after the signing. So, when he opened it, it was a cat's head on like a walking stick. Whoa. So, now that I've brightened everybody's evening, um, <laughs> Given the penguins and the John Waters inflatable doll, or if that is what that is, 
I was wondering, aside from you giving out gifts, I was wondering what is the most eccentric or twisted thing any fan has given you? Uh oh. <laughs> the, uh, I hadn't heard that one, a cat's head. It's probably Jerry's cat. Yeah. <laughs> um, Have you heard the Clive Barker story? Uh, I, I, there was a tire, Tower Books and Records, and I got this one confirmed from Clive Barker, and a kid waded through the line, got up to the table, pulled out a razor blade, ran it over both wrists, started just blood pouring out, and he said, Mr. Barker, this is for you. <laughs> and Clive had the presence of mind to grab this kid's hands and flip them over and smear them all across the kid's books before they hustled him away. And the other one is the Stephen King story, which I've told before. It's kind of a, uh, it's from my friend Kim, who used to run events in Seattle at the University of uh, Washington bookstore. And they got this Stephen King event, apparently. And Kim said to get the event, they had to have room for 5,000 people. And each of those pe persons, people, <laughs> English is like my second language. <laughs> Units. Each of them had to bring, got to bring three items to have signed. And Kim had to stand next to Stephen King and hold an ice pack on his shoulder for the nine hours it was going to take to sign 15,000 items. And just a few items into this long day, he turned to her and he had these huge calluses, go figure, on his thumb and forefinger from the lifetime of signing. And he said, Kim, could you get me a bandage? Uh, my calluses have cracked and I'm starting to bleed on the stock. And before Kim could step off, the first person in line heard that and just blurts out, oh, don't bandage Mr. King till he bleeds on my books. <laughs> and all 5,000 people heard it. And all 5,000 people were screaming, don't bandage Mr. King, not fair. He's got to bleed on my books. <laughs> and he ended up smearing a tiny bit of blood in like 15,000 books. <laughs> but uh, I got nothing like that. That's why I tell their stories. <laughs> Next time you're in town, I'll figure something out. You know, please, no cat heads. Um, the weirdest thing was uh, uh, a woman came up once with, uh, you know, besides the people who say, will you sign my arm? And then the next year when you see them on tour, they've got the signature tattooed. Uh, was a woman came up at a community college event with a tampon. <laughs> and then 10 minutes later, she was back in line. She said, guess where your signature is? And I said, you put a candle up your twat? Anyway, no, that's it. <laughs>